Okay, um, we're going to move on to our next talk, and Paul is going to explain us a few things about stuff they have achieved with Replicant. All right, so greetings everyone. I'm Paul Salkowski, and today I'll be talking a bit about um, what I've accomplished at the Replicant project and what we're going to do next. So uh, there is my email if you, uh, if you want to send me an email about anything. But remember that we have uh, forums and mailing lists and other public means of communication that uh, enable other people to learn about what you're asking. So please only contact me privately if it's a private matter. Right, so what is Replicant? Well, on our website, you can, s you can read that, that sentence. So Replicant is a fully free um, Android distribution running on several devices. Uh, so that's a free software uh, operating system that is putting the emphasis on freedom and privacy and security. So how did it start? Well, um, from the very beginning, it was designed to be some way, some pragmatic way of quickly achieving software freedom on mobile devices. And back when it started, it was uh, in 2010, well, um, the situation on mobile devices was the following. We had the Open Moco Freerunners, that's this black uh, device. Um, that, was, uh, that was really good. I'll talk a bit about it um, a bit later. Um, it, it was a really interesting device. And at the same time, Google um, started the HTC Dream, which is uh, one of the first Android phones. And it's, it, it got the attention of many developers. So many people were working on that, and um, some people, mainly from Libre Planet Italia, thought, "Hey, let's see uh, if we can uh, if we can run fully free software on that uh, on that device. Let, let, let's see what are the non-free parts that are still needed, and let's try to um, get rid of them or replace them." So that's um, that's how the idea of uh, creating a fully free version of Android uh, came up. So now, uh, since the very beginning, Replicant uh, meant to be an ethical project in the sense that it respects um, the user's freedom. And it's also, um, it means mostly that, first of all, we don't distribute non-free software and we don't recommend the use of non-free software because we believe that first distributing non-free software along with the system is taking the decision instead of the user to, to use non-free software and we think that's unacceptable for any project or entity. And we also don't want to recommend the use of uh, non-free software because it's um, the, the, the very uh, ground ideas behi behind replicants uh, are the ideas of free software. So we do not want to recommend non-free software. And obviously we want something that has some sort of use. We want it to be, uh, to do something, right? Not just to be some theoretical system that you can probably build but not really use. We want something that uh, serves a purpose that uh, you can use as a, a phone in that case. And we also care a bit about privacy and security, so we try when possible to um, make it better on that regard. So the, the, the technical grounds for replicants um, are the following. It, it first started with um, uh, as, as a derivative of AOSP, which is the Android Open Source Project, which is roughly the, uh, the free version of Android that Google releases uh, when they feel like it, because sometimes they don't. If you remember Android uh, version 3, they didn't release the source code, and it, uh, we had to wait for version 4. So that's what we use as a base at the very beginning. But um, if you know about it a bit, you, you, you'll see that uh, AOSP only supports a few devices, mostly the, um, the Nexus devices from Google. And uh, that's why we decided to switch to CyanogenMod, which is uh, another community Android version. Um, that supports uh, really a whole lot of more devices, uh, really a whole range of uh, different manufacturers. So it's, it's more interesting for us because it gives us more um, devices to choose from when we want to um, add support to replicants for those. So I, I talked a lot about making a fully free system, but what does it mean technically? Well, um, the, the, the main thing that we have to do is to um, get rid of the non-free software, obviously. So we either just remove it, and in which case the, um, the, the functionality that depends on that piece of software just doesn't work, or we try to replace it. And those non-free bits of uh, software 
or either executable, so usually diamonds that run in the background or libraries, uh, essentially other abstraction libraries. So those are kind of drivers in user case. And obviously we have farmers, um, little bits of uh, code that run on chips, which are, that's not on the main CPU, that's on other chips that are aside the CPU. And uh, obviously we also want to get rid of, uh, get rid of any malicious feature on, uh, on our system because we're based off cyanogen mod, but there is some nasty stuff inside cyanogen mod that we don't really want to have in replicants, uh, especially tracking of the users and stuff like that. Um, cyanogen mod reports to Google Analytics when you use it, and uh, we, d we don't really want that. Uh, we have no reason to tell Google that you're using replicants, so we just get rid of it, obviously. And um, that, that, that's, uh, that's the, the, the core uh, work that is, uh, that is being done on replicants. And obviously there are also some, um, some side tasks that are less important but that we still have to do. And that's mostly, um, yeah, I mean, uh, a non-important part is for instance branding and look and feel. So we change the background so that you know it's replicant, yay. And, um, we also do maintenance and security updates, obviously, like any decent operating system. But uh, when not that um, uh, trivial part is to adapt the system for the lack of non-free uh, components, because uh, mostly the Android code we get expects that non-free software is in place. It expects, for instance, that we have uh, 3D drivers, but we don't, because 3D drivers on those devices are non-free, so we get rid of them. Uh, but the rest of the system expects to be able to use them. So we have to find all sorts of tricks to, um, to get it to still be usable and to still work. So that's a real challenge. And it's the same with firmwares. Um, because, you know, uh, firmwares are usually required by kernel drivers. They load the firmware and then they start discussing with the chip. When the firmware is loaded, the chip is running something and so they can discuss. But when the firmware is not there, because we didn't ship it, obviously, because it's non-free and we don't want to recommend using a non-free uh, program, well, the driver very often uh, doesn't handle that very well. So it might retry to load the firmware in a loop infinitely. Some drivers do that. So we have to correct it, else uh, the CPU uh, explodes and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. So we have to look at those things and adapt and uh, ha add proper code that says, hey, when the, when the non-free firmware is not there, well, just give up and, uh, you know, don't try and best thing to, to, to make contact with the chip. It's not going to work. Right, so uh, um, as I said, we want to have something that works. So that's why we need as many features um, as we can that work on replicants. And that's when we start doing reverse engineering because we can't just say, oh, this is non-free, let's reject it and not use it because that doesn't work. If you do that, you basically cannot boot the system. You cannot do anything with it. So that's when we start looking at what is the non-free piece doing and can we do it uh, with free software instead? That's the whole, um, the whole work that is behind replicants. And that's reverse engineering. It's, um, it's a big piece of work. So um, the, the, the non-free parts are really on um, a variety of different domains. You, you've, you've got some on graphics, on audio, camera, sensors. So real, that's the uh, radio interface library. That's what talks with the modem, the, the, the hardware component that is in charge of um, discussing with the uh, telephony network, the mobile telephony network. So we have, have non-free uh, non program for all those things and uh, even more like hardware video decoding. Uh, there is non-free software for that too. So we have to understand how it works. And how do we do that? Well, we can ask the manufacturers, the, uh, the companies that actually produce the chips. And when we do, we usually get that kind of response, which is chip maker is not in a position to provide details about the formula that we address with the OEM, so the, 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 the phone manufacturer team. So we screwed, basically, uh, very often. So we had to um, really think hard and, and find ways to still understand what it does. And there are many, many uh, interesting techniques to do that. So we can start by looking at logs and tra tracing the execution. We can look at strings on the binary. We can decompile it, uh, look at all that with the assembly. Uh, but we can also uh, trace the kernel driver because thankfully the kernel driver is usually free software. So um, since a non-free component is uh, using the kernel driver to communicate with the hardware, we can intercept the communication and try to decode it at this point. Or we can perhaps modify it and see how 
the non-free program response. So that's uh, the, the sort of thing we do to understand what's going on and to eventually write free software that does the same thing. And sometimes it takes um, a bit of knowledge in math, especially if you're dealing with sensors, where you have some raw data that's coming and you've got calibration values, maybe uh, three, four, five different values, and you have to figure out a, ma a mathematical formula that takes all these things and put them together to have some result that has a physical meaning in the case of sensors. So if you're, if you're working with a magnetic field sensor, uh, that's going to be the case. You're going to have to figure out that formula. Um, and obviously it's very frustrating because uh, very often it fails because it's just too hard. And you need some, um, some really s some background on how these things work. So at first it's very frustrating, but eventually we, we succeed at doing something, right? So eventually we do write some of these free software replacements. And we do that for the things we, uh, that I list, listed, but uh, not for every test, because some of them are just very hard, especially graphics acceleration in 3D. That's something that uh, has never been worked on by uh, replicant developers, because, because it's just very hard, and you need people who are into that field and would know what they're doing. So there are some separate projects that do that for some of the devices um, that we're interested in. So especially there is Freedreno, which is um, um, reverse engineering project uh, that aims to write drivers for um, Arduino GPUs, and it's actually very well advanced. Uh, Rob Clark is working on that, and really it's now it's usable, and you can do a lot of wonderful things with it. There is also Lima that is, um, that is being worked on by uh, Luke Verhagen, which is in the uh, um, graphic dev room just over the, uh, at the other end of uh, the campus. So um, that's a lot of very uh, nice stuff that we don't do ourselves and let others do. And obviously, firmwares are very hard to write as well because they're not executed on the main CPU. Instead, they're working on the separate chip. So usually, they have their own instruction sets and they have all sorts of um, hardware specificities that are just very hard to figure out. So we just leave, it, leave that out. And the modem system, uh, the modem, so the, the piece that talks to the mobile telephone network is coding its own operating system that is, is all non-free, and we don't even try to understand how it works because it's so complex. And uh, thankfully, there is a project that is called Osmocom DB, which does the heavy lifting for that for a few um, old modems, which are Calypso modems that you can find on the Open Moco that I uh, mentioned a bit earlier. So that's great. Um, all these projects are doing these things, and we are not doing it ourselves. But we still do stuff, right? So over the uh, past, I think, three years, that's the stuff I have written. So for the uh, radio interface library, uh, library, I wrote Samsung Real and Leap Samsung IPC. Thankfully, on Leap Samsung IPC, we had external contributions. So that's um, 30,000 lines that worked um, on nine devices. Then you have camera stuff, so that's uh, five to 10,000 lines for devices, audio, sensors, you get the idea. We, we, we wrote um, a good amount of free software to, uh, to get those devices to work. And thankfully, sometimes, um, other communities are interested in uh, lending their hands and helping me do the work. So we had the SHR and FSO community for Leap Samsung IPC. So if you're not familiar with those, um, SHR is a, uh, an operating system that was initially written for the Open Moco. It's a GNU and Linux uh, mobile operating system. Um, so it's, uh, it was interesting for them because uh, they wanted to get it to run on Samsung devices, so they contributed to Leap Samsung IPC, so that was great. And we also have other community Android versions, such as Dynogen Mod, also Omni, um, and um, Team Hackson, which is a uh, specialis spe specialized team of uh, Samsung, of people working on Samsung hardware. So all of those were interested on the camera and audio parts because that's, we wrote that for Samsung devices. Um, and that work uh, usually uh, is shared between, so Cyanogen and Mod and Replicant. So when I write something for Replicants and Cyanogen and Mod people are interested in it, they usually take it and goes the other way around and we share patches and stuff, so it's, it's pretty great. 
And for them, if they're not that interested in uh, having a fully free software stack, it's also a great technical advantage. Well, I'll, I'll mention that a bit uh, further. Yeah. Um, right, so that's a rough timeline of what happened. Uh, it also in uh, December 2010 uh, with the HTC Dream. Then we, uh, Google was kind enough to send us a Nexus One when it came out, so we ad added support for that as well. That was on Replicant 2.2. Um, I joined in in April 2011, worked uh, on the SDK a bit. That's the software development kit. Um, then we went on to work on Leap Samsung IPC, so that's uh, basically the library that talks to the modem on, it was the Nexus S at the time, but it's the same protocol on most Samsung devices. So it started with the Nexus S, but then we extended it for other devices. So then we worked on Samsung Real, added support for the Galaxy S, then the GTA 04, which I will mention mention a bit uh, further. It's a very interesting device for, for many reasons. Uh, we started adding, adding support for it in September 2012, but um, we kind of gave up, I kind of gave up uh, midway, and you can see that back in June 2014, uh, I started to um, work on it again. So I'll, I'll just detail that uh, in a bit. And along the way, we added support for new versions of Android. So we went from 2.2 to 2.3 to 4.0 to 4.2, uh, each time uh, adding new devices. So um, at this point, we have a good number, I think uh, 10 or uh, 11 or 12 different devices supported. And each time we want to add support for a new device, it's a big challenge because uh, devices are essentially very different one from the other. But thankfully, we find similarities, especially um, so on the radio interface layer, as I said, we have Samsung Wheel, which uh, communicates with the Android framework. And that part is common to all devices. It's written in a generic way. And actually, I've, uh, last summer, I've completed a uh, total rewrite of it from scratch, because the old code was not that good. So um, I rewrote that, and it's really generic, and it works well on all 11 or 12 devices. So Leap Samsung IPC, that's the uh, device-specific part that ha implements the different kernel interfaces to communicate with the hardware. So that, that's what we need. So that's a big part of the work that, that uh, was done on Replicant. And um, then you can see that there are different generations and families of devices. So those are using the same chips. On the Nexus S and Galaxy S, you've got uh, a Samsung S5 PC uh, 110, that's the code of the, uh, the, the SOC. On those, we had to work a bit on the camera to get uh, preview working with, without graphic acceleration. That was a bit of a challenge. Uh, sensors, uh, also we had to figure out how do the accelerometers work. That's what you need um, so that your screen rotates when you uh, rotate your device. Uh, also, the magnetic field sensor was very, uh, it was kind of challenging on both devices. Uh, that's what you need to get compass. If you're lost and if uh, you have a compass application, it's going to use the magnetic field sensor, sensor coupled with the accelerometer to uh, figure out uh, the position of the north, basically. And that's how, you, um, that's how you find your way. So that's kind of important, right? And on the uh, Galaxy S2, Galaxy Note, that's basically the same device. The Galaxy Note has a bigger screen, but it's really basically the same hardware. Um, there was a big problem with audio because they're using a, um, a non-conventional chip, which is the Yamaha MC1 and 2. And people at Cyanogen Mod were calling it uh, Yamaha because it was uh, a whole lot of non-free libraries that uh, did not integrate well with the uh, standard Android um, environment. So it was uh, terrible for them. And um, at some point, I just looked at it and wrote a free implementation for audio. So that was a big challenge as well. It was kind of hard, but doable. And the same thing was uh, going on with the camera. Uh, the camera needed a non-free um, non module. So I replaced that as well. And on the Galaxy S3 and Note 2, so that's a newer generation, 
Um, there was the same uh, problem with the camera, which needed a non-free blob. So then again, I replaced it. It was a different, um, different interface. So I kind of reused the same code, but mostly changed it. So it was a bit of that. And the, 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 the back camera was very interesting, the S5C73M3, uh, because it, had, it has a very unusual interleaved format. Because if you look at the, um, the, the propaganda, the uh, marketing stuff for the Galaxy S3, you'll see that on that device you can actually record a video and take photos at the same time. So that implies that the data that we get is both uh, a preview frame that is, that is used for recording and a very high quality frame on demand. So we, I kind of had to figure this out and it was not so easy. All right, so that's the stuff that was accomplished mostly. And where are we today? Well. Um, currently, there is one developer working on it, that's me on spare time. Uh, I'm kind of busy, so it's not moving forward very fast. Um, we have very few external contributions. Mostly, the list I uh, gave earlier is uh, where it stops. That's just um, three, four different groups that, that helped because they don't really anymore. Uh, our latest version is uh, based on uh, Sarinag and Moad version 10.1, which is Android 4.2. And we support up to 12 different devices, which are mostly Samsung Galaxy and Nexus devices. So why those devices? Because um, they're the easiest ones uh, to liberate, basically, because they don't require so many blobs, so we can do it, and because um, uh, Nexus devices were good at the very beginning because it was easy to install another version of Android on them. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of normal that you can refresh your device with another operating system, but back in 2012, it was really hard to find devices that would allow that. So that's why Nexus devices and Samsung devices, just because the, uh, the chips they're using, the Exynos chips, are actually not so bad for freedom. and. I mean, we're used, I'm used to working on those, so yeah. And the whole thing is funded thanks to donations. I'm not paid for the work I do. And devices are expensive when you have to buy 12 different devices. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. So that's why um, we ask for donations and it really helps. And also to fund trips like, um, like this time to Fosdem so I can even talk to you right now. That's funded thanks to donations, so that's really great, and thanks everybody for your support, really. So that's what we've been, I've been doing. I say we because um, I'm the only active developer, but some other persons are involved in the decision-making process, especially we're working a lot with the Free Software Foundation that handles donations for us, so we kind of uh, discuss the direction for the project, and. Uh, um, past developer Gyuku, uh, Danny Karaki from his real name, uh, who started the project, is still around, is not contributing technically very much, but uh, we, we discuss a lot about what should we do, what we should do, and what uh, will be our next steps for the future. So that's where we are now. And well, if you take a step back and look at those, that's the devices we support. All right, cool. But all of those have what we call bad modem isolation. It means that on those devices, the modem, which is always connected to the mobile telephony network and running non-free software, well, this, this piece of hardware has access to the rest of the device to a certain extent. We know that on the Nexus S and Galaxy S, it can read and write the RAM, and that's very bad. Uh, if you have some... Um, sensitive data, or if you're doing encryption or whatever, the fact that non-free software that can be controlled remotely has access to your RAM mostly compromises uh, your device. So that's, that's really terrible for privacy and security. And the HTC Grim and Nexus one, well, it's, those are Qualcomm platforms where the, the modem and the main processor are on the main chip. So we can have very strong suspicions that the modem can access basically everything. And we know, for instance, that uh, the modem uh, system is stored on the same memory as the operating system. So if the, um, if the modem can load the system from that storage, it can also load your data and can probably 
certainly also modify your data. So that's, that's uh, uh, an incredible risk for security. So those are very bad devices. Well, what about the others? Well, we cannot tell for sure um, whether the, mo the modem isolation is good or bad. We just don't have any clue that it's bad, but it doesn't mean it's good. It just means we don't know, right? Uh, because the only way we can find out about those things are mostly unreliable. I mean, we, we cannot uh, just open the device and look at the board. It's incredibly complex. We've got multi-layer uh, circuit board. We can't just uh, look. It's, yeah, it's too hard. And um, when we know that it's bad for sure, it's because we have it in, for instance, the kernel, um, the kernel source code. It's very clear that uh, the, the random access memory is shared between the modem and the CPU. So then we can say, yeah, OK, we know it's bad for sure. So all those devices uh, may be good, but we don't really know. And then you've got that problem with bootloaders. Bootloaders are basically the equivalent of the BIOS on x86 platforms. So that's uh, kind of the first piece of software that's executed at boot. It's not exactly, because there is something before the bootloader, which is called the boot ROM, and that is um, read-only on, uh, on the SOC chip itself. So that you cannot modify, and it's always going to be there on every single SOC. But the bootloader, that's the next stage. It's before the kernel. Well, that piece, well, um, you can reinstall, you can modify, in theory. But now what happens is that um, on most modern devices uh, like those, on most modern platforms, the, um, the chip makers decided that um, the, the bootloader would have a numeric signature. So more just kind of like a GPG signature where you have a private key that you use to sign the binary and you have a public key that you use to verify the signature. Well, in that case, the boot ROM inside the SOC has, it has the, the, the public key and it uses that public key to uh, check whether the signature is correct or not. And if it's not, it refuses to boot. So what does it mean? Well, it means that if you want to replace the bootloader on those, you need to have the private key to sign the bootloader so that it will allow it to boot. And obviously we don't because the private keys are, well, private, so we don't have access to them. And what does it mean in the end? Well, it just means that we cannot have free bootloaders on all these devices. So all the time we've spent trying to liberate these devices, well, in the end, um, it cannot be, you know, it's, it's limited. You know, we cannot do any better than that. We cannot free it anymore. We cannot have a free bootloader. So that's a big issue. So what do we do now? Well, there are basically two different directions. The first one is to say, well, that's the way it is. We'll just keep adding support for more devices. We'll just try to catch up with Samsung who makes a new revision of their Galaxy S line every six months or whatever, we'll try to, you know, work and uh, have those supported. Great. So to do that, obviously, we need the latest Android versions because uh, the, the new phones are not running Android 4.2 anymore. They're, they're running on the new version. So we have to keep up. And that's a lot of work to keep up um, with the, the new devices, the new versions. And it doesn't really bring anything for freedom because that's what we're mostly concerned about. We want software freedom, right? And on those, we know we're not going to have non-free bootloaders. And um, we will try to avoid the devices that have bad modem isolation. So mostly the Qualcomm platforms and others that we know are bad. We're going to try to avoid those. Well, of course, that's a good idea because uh, in s to some extent, it's a good idea because if those devices are going to exist, they might as well run a fully free system, even if they cannot have a free bootloader, it's already something, right? So it's great. But we have, I mean, I have a very limited time. So uh, what else can we do? Well, that was the second idea, which is to focus on a smaller number of devices, but devices that are essentially better, that do allow to have free bootloaders, and that uh, we're not proven to have uh, bad modem isolation. That's why it says allegedly good modem isolation. And that's how we take freedom to the next step, right? That's, that's really, um, that's moving forward. 
So obviously, since I have a very little time, I decided to go with that solution. And I'll be talking a bit um, in, the next, in the second part of that presentation about what exactly I've been doing lately um, with that in mind. And we, uh, by the way, we also often get um, people asking me or the, the community, why, but why do you keep working on Android, right? Everybody knows Android's crap, and why do you still work on it? Why not Python or Firefox OS or Ubuntu Phone or whatever? Well, there are basically two reasons. The first one is that, um, or even three reasons. The first one is that Android is quite mature, right? We've got all the features uh, around that are already there. We don't need to write any of, the, um, any of the interface. We don't need to do any of that. We just have to take it and replace the, the non-free drivers, which are also on Tizen and Firefox OS, because obviously um, those projects, their uh, new free operating system, but really what they replaced is just the, uh, the common stuff, what was already free in Android. So the framework, the applications, that's nice, but that's not really what we need. What we need is free hardware support, right? Um, so, 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 so that's one reason. Um, another reason is that Android supports a really a crazy amount of devices. I don't know if you can even count the number of Android devices out there. It's incredible. Uh, if you look at Tizen or Firefox OS, I know that Tizen um, released the Samsung Z, something like that, a few weeks ago, which is the only official Tizen device. So, um, well, that's one device. That, that's not much interest. And if we're going to have to port Tizen to another device, it's going to be a lot of additional work. Uh, and we don't really have time to do that, right? We want to write hardware support. That's what's important. And Firefox OS, that's basically the same story. Uh, you've got some officially supported devices, more and more of those, but they're Qualcomm devices. So to us, they're not interesting at all. And, uh, well, uh, it's kind of um, wasting our time. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's why we still uh, go with Android. So really quickly, the, um, the open Moco Furuna. So that was uh, the first historical example of a good device. It had free PCB design and isolated modern, uh, no loaded non-free firmwares, but obviously still non-free firmwares running uh, inside the chips that were pre-installed. You can say it's firmwares, you can say it's uh, equivalent to circuitry. You decide. Right. So it had free boot loader, free system and all, but it's kind of old. It's only uh, 400 megahertz, 128 megabytes of RAM. That's really, that's the low end and that's kind of slow. Um, and eventually the company that made that phone retired and the community also retired. There are still a few systems like QTMoco and I think SHR is um, rebooting in a way, but that's, that's mostly the past. So that's when a company called Golden Delicious in 2011, 2012 decided to introduce a motherboard replacement for that device. And that's the GTA 04. It's uh, just that motherboard that you insert back in the uh, GTA 02 case. And it's, uh, it's new hardware. You have a Noma 3, which is uh, reasonably efficient. By today's standards, it looks maybe now a bit slow, but it's still better than uh, the, uh, the Open Moco. So we've got that stuff, many uh, cool hardware features. And most importantly, it has a free bootloader. It doesn't, the, the chip doesn't check the signatures, so you can actually build your own bootloader and install it. Uh, we have supposedly good modem isolation um, because we have mostly the PCB design, so we can uh, check that to an extent, even though we cannot know that the kernels match the actual board. We, I mean, it's still something, it's not perfect, right? And a friendly manufacturer, Debian supported, and the chips are well documented for uh, the protocols they use. So that's, that's, that's great. So obviously, we were, I was interested in that device uh, very early, right? In uh, mid-2012, when Replicant uh, 2.3 uh, started getting involved in that, but there was uh, really a lot of trouble with the, the modern, no, sorry, the, no, the kernel, right? We had no power management support, a lot of issues with suspend and resume. Uh, so it was, it was not really good. And you also, when working on Android, you also have the problem of, of um, getting the Android parts of the kernel working with, um, with the rest of the kernel because the kernel that existed for the GTA 04 was a um, regular kernel 
Linux kernel at the time. It didn't have any of the Android pieces, so uh, I tried to add that and miserably failed because it was technically hard. I think I was in high school, I didn't really know what I was doing, so it just failed. And there was, at the time, nobody else to pick up the work, so it just stayed there for yeah, a year or so. And thankfully, um, Golden Delicious, the company um, that produces the phone, came up with a Linux 3.12 kernel that has decent support, that, um, on which it was easy to merge the Android features, and uh, on which Kian is kind of working, there are two issues, but it's there. So at this point, I started uh, working on replicant support, so that's why you can, uh, on the timeline I showed previously, you could see that um, the GTA 04 support was back. And that's uh, where it is now. So we have two versions, uh, one made by the manufacturer, Golden Delicious, where they, um, they use a single partition approach, which allows them to have multi-boot, multi multiple operating systems. Um, uh, in parallel, they also support other form factors because they also make a tablet with a bigger screen and stuff. They, um, they have work in progress uh, radio interface library, so to make calls and stuff. They have work in progress sensors, and they ship the non-free Wi-Fi firmware, something we don't want to do and uh, that we won't ever do. On the other hand, on the official replicant version, we have a uh, typical Android part partition scheme where you have three, four partitions that are separate, and this allows for having encryption because uh, Android is um, the, um, the Android system is expecting that sort of partition layout, and so that's how uh, encryption is implemented. So on the upstream of the conversion, you have encryption, and we also have recovery, which is a nice interface to install the system, whatever. Well, <coughs> so what about the future? Um, so there is a, a community called Open Linux, which is... Um, just a community really about the GTA 04 and other devices that are alike, like the Neo 900, which is an upcoming motherboard replacement for the N900 that was originally made by Nokia. So um, the plans for the future regarding Replicant is for me to add um, real support, sensors, blues, all the stuff that's missing basically on the official Replicant version so that uh, you, know, you can use all those stuff those things, that's important, obviously. We want to have a fully operational kernel, so no more PM issues. That would be cool. Uh, and have multiple devices support, so also the tablet versions of that hardware uh, supported, and all with a single image. So that would be interesting, because on Android, you usually make one, uh, one image per device. And that's a waste, because when the devices are really close, you could have some uh, runtime um, changes and optimizations going on. So that's what I'll try to do. So there you have some links uh, to learn more about this project and uh, you're welcome to pre-order the next revision of the GTA 04 or your Neo 100. Those are really interesting stuff, uh, really interesting things. Right, so mostly what I wanted to talk to you about today and I'll probably have to be fast because I'm kind of running out of time. Um, that's the LG Optimus Black. Uh, so over the last few months, I've written a uh, series of blog articles called A Hacker's Journey Freeing a Phone from the Ground Up. So uh, it's all about this device, the LG Optimus Black, which uh, was released by LG back in 2011. Uh, it has an OMAP3 platform, just like the uh, GTA 04. And the technical documentation leaked online about it. So that, uh, on that file, um, you get basically all the, um, all the electrical wiring of the device, you get many relevant uh, information about, about it, so it's really, really great, it's something really nice. We have uh, U-boot and X-loaders, so those are boot loaders. So source code was released by LG because I think those are uh, GPL licensed software, so they released the source code, the modified uh, source code, so that's really great. And what's Really interesting about it also is that it's an OMAP GP device uh, because the OMAP, so that's um, the SOC made by uh, Texas Instruments, you have one uh, high security HS version which uh, does check the signatures as I mentioned earlier and you have the GP which does not and usually on mainstream devices you get the HS version and on this one we were very lucky to find that it's a GP device. That's 
uh, dev mem something, that's how you find out what it is. Um, zero three means GT, and I think if you, if you had zero A, it would have meant HS. So we were lucky. So no signature checks, reboot loaders are possible. Well, that's great, but how do we run code on the device? How do we replace uh, the bootloader, right? Because that's all we want. We want a free bootloader, we want to replace it. Well, um, let's first think about how it boots. To find out where it's going to load the bootloader from, there are this series of registers which uh, indicate um, what the boot priority, right? Bec because you've got different options and obviously um, the boot phone has to decide where to look for the bootloader first and then second and, and so on. So that's, um, that schematic is extracted from the technical documentation Netflix. So you see a few registers. Some have a little box around them, which means that they may or may not be there. So what I did basically was to open the device and get the board like that out of it. Uh, out of it. Just uh, get a very good uh, lens and you just try to know is that register there or not. So eventually uh, I came up with this schematics, which uh, is the reality, what's actually on the device. And so you see that uh, when you're wired to uh, 1.8 volt, that's a logical one. When you're to wired to ground, that's a logical zero. So from that, you, you get the, um, the sysboot thing. And when you look at the uh, BioMap documentation, it says, well, if sysboot five equals zero, and if you have sysboot um, bits zero to four that equal this, it means that uh, first off, you have, you have the MMC, and second, you have the USB. So the MMC is internal storage. And that's great, but if I want to, if I want to develop my own bootloader, if I install it to the memory and it fails, I'm not going to be able to write it to write a new version on it because it just won't boot. So I need to have USB first, right? And if you look at the documentation, uh, you can see that when sysboot five equals one, it's the opposite. It's USB first and then MMC one. So what I needed to do was to uh, change uh, sysboot five and. As you can see, it's the only one that, that has two registers. So I figured that if you remove one of those, uh, you're going to uh, get either zero or one. Currently it's zero, I want it to be one. Well, what do I do? I remove the resistor from, uh, which is down there, uh, connected to ground. Then I get, uh, sorry, then I get a logical one on sysboot five and uh, USB boot first. So it means removing a resistor on a very tiny board like that. Um, it's possible, I've done it three times, I think. I succeeded every time and I'm not very good at soldering, so if you just have good equipment, it's possible to do it. Um, so that's just one very tiny resistor to remove. Uh, that's the schematics, that's the actual board. So you can see it's kind of, uh, yeah, very tiny. And when you do that, you connect USB and you see this, which is the boot phone asking for code. So that's great. Now we can load our code, but, uh, but now what? We're still blind. Sure, our code loads, but we don't see it running, right? It's not going to initialize the LCD. It's, uh, it's really complex to do that. So how do, we, uh, how do we get some output? Well, that's when you need serial output, so that's UART, UART. And um, that, that, that's something you need to, um, to see what's going on. So where do you get UART? Well, you've got uh, connect, um, yeah, some connectors on this side of, uh, of the board. And if you can see that's as big as that. So you've got to solder two, two very tiny wires on those pads. It's incredibly hard. I've succeeded twice, I think. But every time when putting the, uh, the board back on the case, the wire would break or something, and so it never works out. And eventually, um, I found out that you also have UART um, on some switch that is uh, accessible from, uh, I mean from the board. So I just find out about where physically the connectors are on the chip and just solder the very tiny wire there. And eventually, it worked. Um, after some, work, some time, I was able to finally load my code and it said free software for free society, which is nice. And, and so, yeah, it worked. So now it was time to begin the real work, right? And so I made some uh, very uh, big contact pads so that it would be reliable. And in the end, 
device looks like this, it's the same one, where you have um, serial connectors that are easy to do. So it was time to actually start the work. Um, there was a version of Exploder by LG that, um, that I used at first, but um, it turned out that Exploder is kind of deprecated. So I made it work, had a problem with I2C, but I'm not going to detail it, it's on my blog, read it if you're interested. If you're interested, it was fun, um, you know, it was hard and fun and I learned a lot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, eventually, I uh, started adding upstream support for it, using EU boot SPL instead of Exploder, you know where it is if you're familiar with EU boot, that's the, uh, the first, um, first stage bootloader. So that's what I did, using the reference code from LG, because uh, I can't just uh, invent what, uh, what it's supposed to do, I just read and adapt in a clean upstream way. And already got a few patches accepted, um, some that are generic to the map or stuff like that, because if you want to send patches um, specific to the board, you first have to commit the board support and it's not ready yet, so it's going to be one very big uh, series of patches that I will submit when the basic stuff is ready. So at this point, there is uh, Muxing, external SD card boot, stuff like that, USB support, I got running, uh, I think last week, with fast boots, so that's the usual Android, uh, Android thing. So with that, you will be able to reflash the device easily if you load the kernel from USB, stuff like that. And the kernel I'm using is uh, Clockwork Mode Recovery. That's the usual uh, recovery thing. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty great because you've got uh, the interface and everything on an init from FS, so you don't really have to have a full system aside. So yeah, useful. Um, for the future, I'd like to have LCD, keys detection to decide uh, what device to boot from, and um, proper kernel boot because there are some issues with that. Um, getting serial out of the USB connector would be very nice too. Um, it's possible on the hardware, you have switches where you can re um, direct the uh, serial to the USB connector. So that would allow uh, most people to get uh, serial without having to solder on the, um, the switch like I did. So that's something nice to have. And obviously I'm going to add replicant support for it. Um, the challenges will, will be to add real support and sensors I'm going obviously to document all of what I did on the replicant wiki, which I didn't do yet because I uh, was very busy, and um, have maybe upstream kernel support at some point. That would be nice, why not? Not so many phones run up upstream Linux, so that's an occasion to do it, why not? And it's not all that great though because some uh, features will still be missing with free software, especially GPS. It's a chip that takes an, un an unknown protocol that I didn't figure out. Um, the DSP, so that's for, in that case it's used for uh, video decoding. That's, um, that's not going to work with, without a non-free software and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is the usual. So just very quickly, I'm also going to focus on Arduino tablets. I just started, uh, those are great because you can uh, also run new boots and free bootloaders on them. There was a great community called Linux Sanctuary. I think I'm not the first person to talk about it today. So Arduino, uh, the company is uh, not very supportive, but the community is very great. You've got some high quality drivers and code written for it, so that's, that's pretty cool. I'm going obviously to add replicant support for that, and since there are, there are so many cheap Chinese tablets um, that add support, for that, uh, sorry, that use that platform. I'm going to try to add support for all of them at the same time, so with a, uh, a single image that can adapt uh, at runtime on, um, to each tablet. So that would be challenging, but I have a pretty clear idea on how I'll do it. So those I don't have time to, um, to discuss, but it's interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, I already have a handful of devices, I think five or six, so I'll be adding support for them over you know, like the next month, I'll try. And uh, so, yeah, uh, there are challenges because every hardware is a bit different, so we have to have um, tunnel drivers for each, uh, for each tablet uh, and user space modules. I don't really have time to detail that so much, but you can also add support for your own device. 
Um, then a few other things I would like to do uh, soon, that's adding support for the Kindle Fire because it's also a GP device, but it's on my phone, it's a bit more different. It's also a very interesting device. Uh, there is al already a free boot loader on it, so that's great. There is um, maybe more devices, more interesting devices to, to discover. Um, also, I'd like to update the Replicant Wiki so that it would have um, stuff for device evaluation. So how do you find out whether your device is uh, good or not? That would be interesting. Um, have a bit of documentation about how each device is, is flawed regarding privacy and security, and also modern isolation. Make a list of which devices have um, which, yeah, which devices have uh, signed and non-free bootloaders, all that stuff, and how to get UART and stuff. So that's something to do. Right. So if you want to learn more about replicants. Uh, website, blog, and wiki, that's uh, the places we usually use to communicate. Uh, sorry, to uh, mostly announce stuff and provide content. Well, to communicate, we have our forums, mailing list, IRC channel, and you're welcome to get in touch with, uh, with me, with the community, to maybe get involved and, and do stuff. So that's all. that's all. Thank you for your time and attention. Do you have time for questions? Not really. Not really? Okay, so if you have questions, you can just catch me uh, on the way out or whatever.